This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Aloha. How is your anxiety level today? I'm Kaui Lucas, host of Hawaii is My Man Leon, live streaming every other Friday on Think Tech Hawaii and available thereafter 24-7 on YouTube and thinktechhawaii.com. When I begin to feel overwhelmed by the apparently catastrophic trajectory of human endeavors, one of my favorite things, comfort thoughts, is Dr. Elizabeth Satouris' explanation of how we got here and nature's next logical evolutionary step. That's why the title of the show is Beyond Darwin, Satouris, Science, and Hope. Dr. Elizabeth Satouris is an evolution biologist, futurist, author, speaker, and consultant on living systems design. It's been a year and a half since we've been in the studio together. Welcome back, Elizabeth. So good to be here again, Kelly. <laughs> so um, there's um, been in this year and a half just sort of reflecting. On, it's a different world, mm -hmm. and it feels like we've been um, put in a little bit of a pressure cooker. Um, as far as uh, catastrophic events and, and, and unease, and not a day goes by when I don't have a conversation with someone about this upset and tension. And I always come back to your words. Um, recently, I heard an interview you did uh, on Tree Sisters, uh, which I'll post the link to uh, on the comments of the YouTube once the show is up. But I loved your um, ex simple explanation of the organisms and how they evolved. Can you just take us right through that? Yes, it's, it's interesting because uh, in school we get taught Darwinian evolution, and it kind of starts as though the, the first half of evolution was just a primal sludge and then uh, it gets going when you've got uh, visible-sized creatures on the planet. And actually, what happened in the first half of evolution is the most fascinating. The, the creatures of Earth that had the, the whole planet to themselves for half of evolution were bacteria, ancient bacteria. And uh, they are more like us, in a way. They're our most ancient ancestors. And they're more like us than any other creatures since, because they're the only other creatures who actually caused global problems and solved them. And they were problems of hunger and of pollution, exactly the kinds of problems that we're facing today. So that's what makes their story so fascinating. And I call them as they evolved the bubblers, the blue-greens, and the breathers. The BBBs, right? <laughs> because that makes it easy. Bubblers ferment things. They were the first ones. They fermented the free sugars and acids on the planet, and they gobbled them all up in order to, to make their lifestyle work, and they coated the whole planet. Well, how did they solve that starvation process? Uh, they, they invented a new way of being, which I call the blue-greens, which was making your own food from what was left, which was the, the, the minerals, the sunlight, and the water. So they invented photosynthesis, blue-greens, right? And the oxygen that was their waste product then began to pollute the problem. It was soaked up by the oceans and by the earth and, and then eventually into the atmosphere, and it was choking things off. Oxygen can be a deadly gas. So they had to invent yet another lifestyle, which I call the breathers, and we are breathers, right? <laughs> who used the oxygen uh, instead of as a pollutant to break up food molecules. So where were they going to get the food molecules? They had to invade other uh, big bloated bacteria where they could still find them and the bubblers, right? And they took aboard the blue-greens to make food and the breathers developed motors so that they could sail this whole enterprise, this cooperative, uh, into a sunlit water area. And so we find these bacteria creating these problems and solving them without benefit of brain. And here we are, billions of years later, following in their footsteps. And we're just now learning 
that we have far more bacteria coating our insides and our outsides and taking care of us, being 80% uh, of our immune system, wow. uh, keeping us out of trouble, being the first line of defense against what we put in our mouths and on our skins. And a wonderful science author named Lewis Thomas quipped many years ago now in his book, Lives of a Cell, maybe the ancient bacteria built us as big taxis to get around in safely. <laughs> and it's looking more and more like he was right. How about that? <laughs> That's beautiful. Okay, so something happened that they were, that they, these cells without the benefit of, of Brain. Our brain. <laughs> um, they were allowed to, I mean, they were forced in a way to find another way, so they adapted. Mm -hmm. So let's let's look at where we are now in our in our present situation of being pretty much all over the globe mm -hmm. and not doing a really good job of, of um, keeping our house clean. Mm -hmm. And uh, the possibilities for destruction are, are certainly bigger and better than they have ever been. And there's a lot of anxiety around that. So how do we, how do we s change this? How do we mm -hmm. tap into that, that natural system? What's our next step? Yes. <laughs> okay. To understand that, uh, what I found in evolution was not that Darwin was wrong, but that the Darwinian theory only accounts for the youthful phase of species. Uh, and that was th those first two billion years while the bacteria were doing all these creative solutions and stuff, they still hadn't done a major step in evolution. They were working out their own systems and stuff. But the big step came when the bubblers, blue greens, and breathers came together as a huge cooperative entity. When there were so many uh, breathers and, and blue greens inside a great giant expanded bubbler cell that they became the nucleated cell that we are made of. Now, that was the first time that the competitive phase, most of their inventions happened during the competitive phase, right, morphs into the cooperative phase because it turns out that it's less energy expensive to cooperate than to compete. So what happened was when they formed the big cell, first major leap in evolution, they were new, these new nucleated big cells, about a thousand times bigger than a single bacterium, right? Okay. Uh, they were new on the planet, so they had to go through their youth of competition for another billion years until the second big step happens, and they cooperate as multi-celled creatures. Now you can fast forward through all the part you learned about the creatures starting in the sea and coming onto land and the flowering plants and the dinosaurs and all that up to humanity because we know that part. It's that early part that we have been missing. So here we humans are having to go through our youth and mature phases. And what happened is that uh, about six to 10,000 years ago, humans started to develop the first villages that moved into city-sized entities. And when you look at a city from an airplane, if it hasn't been built overnight in the Middle East or, or in China, <laughs> as if it's grown naturally, it is like a living cell on a substrate. You see that nuclear hub with all the, the uh, big business center and all, and the transport the systems downtown. and everything, remarkably like uh, a city is a cell. So that was our first time of building cooperatives, usually at the crossroads uh, between trade routes, right? And those, some of those still exist today as very functioning cooperative cities. Look at us in Honolulu. We've got almost a million people cooperating beautifully. We are an incredibly cooperative species, right? Uh, very few of us are misbehaving compared to all those of us who cooperate daily in so many ways. That's a really good reminder. It's often um, we get sort of hung up on the on the outliers that are that are problematic. Mm -hmm. But in general, especially mm -hmm. here in Hawaii, I think uh, we do have that um, cooperative spirit. Yes, we do, because we have an indigenous culture backing us up, our Aloha culture. And that's the interesting thing is that the indigenous peoples of Earth, 
went through the maturation process into cooperative things like building those first cities. But the cities were new on the planet, so again, they had to go through their youth. And they started to compete and went into empire building. So we had empires ruled by emperors, and then they were followed by empires uh, ruled by you know national empires, and now we've got corporate empires, which is the last phase of this empire building uh, era in humanity. So if we look to the indigenous cultures who already figured out that cooperation is cheaper energetically or nowadays, we let's say, in money, because um, money is our current kind of energy system, uh, they got that. But the industrial culture grew up in that competitive empire phase, and we're in its last gasp. So if you think of this as our adolescent crisis, and we know that we have indigenous elders on the planet who still understand cooperation and community, put those together and Hawaii would be the perfect place to really role model a sustainable cooperative future. Okay, so a, a little bit, so how did we get off track? What was the, the an adolescent crisis, darling. <laughs> <laughs> as, as, as an industrial species now, a globalized industrial so, species, we are in adolescent crisis right now. We have to get beyond the competitive empire phase, recognizing that it will be much cheaper for us to cooperate in friendly ways, and we're seeing that. For instance, I just read that a thousand cities across the the planet are now being called to do 100% clean green energy within the next couple of decades, right? Here in Honolulu, we're one of the 100 resilient cities that the Rockefeller Foundation has been sponsoring to solve our chronic problems and to build resilience against the climate disasters. When I was at the uh, uh, World Expo a couple of years ago in Milan, they talked about the rise of the city as opposed to the nation state as the mm -hmm. the most important um, social and economic uh, entity. entity. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so it seems to be uh, absolutely because nation states are arbitrarily scratched boundaries uh, on the planet. Right? They're not natural boundaries. They're not natural boundaries. Right. They were they were built. They were drawn out of conflict. Yes, and they kept the empire business going, you know, by having nations take over other nations and, and build these big empires. And now the corporations are doing kind of the same thing, competing for territory. And interestingly, China now is, is going through a fascinating stage, probably the last empire stage, as real estate developers buying up land all over the planet and developing it rather than fighting their enemies. So they've gotten that part, that it's cheaper to feed your enemies than to compete with them, to kill them off, to bump them off. And they're doing that. They're building jobs along the way as they develop this real estate. So they may be the transition phase between you know, competitive empire and a cooperative world. So in the, in the uh, competitive, trying to move that competitive empire out of out of that mindset, mm -hmm. um, that's gonna, what is that gonna take? It takes a new story that's rooted in some of the ancient indigenous stories that understood cooperation, understood nature. But it has to be a story in which we get that the human economy can't make nature subservient to its growth, but that we have to fit it into nature. I call this ecosophy. Oh. That means, uh, Sophia means wisdom, the wise society, the ecos, which is household in Greek, uh, and from which we get the words ecology, economy, and now ecosophy. I didn't invent the word ecosophy, but I use it a lot. And we have made economy so, uh, superior to ecology, we turn that around and fit our economies into our natural planet, which we depend on, right? We can build a future of elegant simplicity that will be just fabulous if we make it a wise society and ecosophy. Okay, that was a lot. We're going to take a little break <laughs> and let that ecosophy sort of sink into our bones a little. This is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. 
Greetings, it's me, Angus McTech, the longtime host and star of Hibachi Talk. Think Tech is important to our community because we bring all kinds of cool ideas and I bring gadgets to the, to the show. So you gotta watch it for sure. But for the first time, Think Tech Hawaii is participating in an online web-based fundraising campaign to raise $40,000. Give thanks to ThinkTech. We'll run only during the month of November and you can help. Please donate what you can that ThinkTech in Hawaii can continue to be public awareness and promote civic engagement through free programming like mine. And I'm in charge. I've already made my donation and it's really hard to get discussed when to make a donation, but I already did. Please send in your tax deductible contribution by going to this website. Thanks for thinktech.cosbox.com. Say that three times fast. Closing. On behalf of the community enriched by ThinkTech, Hawaii's 30 plus weekly shows, thank you and we're mahalo for watching ThinkTech and your gen generosity. Let your wing gang free wherever you be. Aloha! Welcome back to Hawaii is my mainland. I'm Kawi Lucas and with me is Elizabeth Soturis, who is all things wise and wonderful. And <laughs> um, we, uh, we were talking about ecosophy. This is a beautiful term. I'm going to look it up when I get home <laughs> and, and find out more about it. But somehow we have to change the, the idea that, that we're so focused on winning, on uh, the, the competitive thing, building leadership. You know, you, all these programs for kids are, uh, it's all about leadership and, and winning and how, how, building up self-esteem. How do we um, do that kind of empowering without making it competitive? Yes, well, uh, my dear friend Hazel Henderson, uh, who has the website Ethical Markets, long ago talked about shifting from win-lose societies to win-win societies, that it's possible not to have the kind of competition in which some people win and other people lose, usually few winners, many losers, but to build uh, societies in which everybody wins, in which everyone can flourish, and there's no reason why we can't do that anymore. But, but we're not. Yeah. But we're not doing it yet because we're in this transition phase from our competitive youth to our mature cooperative phase. Now, I think we're going to be shoved, kicking and screaming into the next phase by things like climate change, right? Uh, which notice that every time that there's a disaster on the planet, over 95% of people cooperate. It's in our b blood and bones to be able to do it. You know, we, we are a highly cooperative species. We haven't talked about that because of the Darwinian competitive model. Although the Soviet Union taught evolution biology through Kropotkin's work called mutual aid because they wanted individuals to sacrifice themselves to build community and we sacrifice community for individual interests and if you just put them together you get a whole picture okay so now maturity let's <laughs> using those models let's mm. let's think about Japan which mm. is a collectivist society but um, capitalist so I don't know how they manage to um, combine the two. I think the better examples are the Scandinavian countries, which despite their difficult climate, where half the year is blacked out and half the year you can't sleep for the light, uh, and it's pretty cold, they have economies in which people pay very high taxes as sharing your income with your community and then don't have to worry about education, transportation, uh, health care, all of those things are then covered for them. So they have a very strong social network kind of economy, uh, but they also have individual enterprise, so they're practicing capitalism and communism in balance as a kind of socialism. And they're not huge multinational, um, I mean, they're obviously they're not multinational. They're not huge, multi, they're not even very multi-ethnic. It's, it's changing. You know, that is that is the one thing that you can say that it was easier for them to do because they have a more harmonious population. But that's and changing story. too. Their, 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 their story. And a strong story. Yeah. Uh, yes, but 
the fact is that on all the polls, the, the people are happiest there, more happy there than anywhere else in the world, which is why I brought up that this combination of taking care of each other through, uh, you know, a, a social welfare inclined government and having the capitalist uh, entrepreneurship going, we can do that. We can bring those things together so that they work for everyone. And if those uh, capitalist um, economies or endeavors were in actually incentivizing the things we want instead of this sort of strange, it's incentivizing profit but not not including in the profit the the costs yeah. of the the damage of cleaning up the you know we we we're right. still buying styrofoam yeah. <laughs> well, and plastics. <laughs> we're trying at Chaminade University in the business school to change things uh, a little bit on that score. I had the privilege of working with uh, Kawila Clark and Ramsey Tom, well known here in yes, Honolulu, yes. Uh, who of course are of the native Hawaiian culture. And uh, together with Dean Scott Schroeder and myself, the four of us designed four new programs as an optional core curriculum in the MBA program at Chaminade called Island Economies. And we're looking at what will it take to make Hawaii sustainable and thriving in a future where climate change will cause our beaches to go underwater and much of Waikiki and Kaka'ako and uh, our, our north coast and you know, things will be going underwater. And there's no way to stop that anymore. You see, the hotter it gets, the more the ice melts, right? Yeah. And, and the, the more, more the ice wider. melts, the hotter it gets. That's a positive feedback loop that can't be changed through any of our technologies. Although we might be able to slow it down a little bit by getting carbon dioxide out of the air and stuff. Right now, that's a, a big fight because our government is, doesn't believe that climate change is happening. So um, if we can take the... Hawaiian values of community, the ahupua'a, divisions of land, where everybody had farms that went all the way from the mountaintop forests through the agricultural fields down to the ocean for sea supplies in food and stuff, much more equitable kind of arrangement, and also fitting the ecosystem uh, so that it was, it was a more natural way of living. But so we have to talk about how much of our native food supply can we bring back? Uh, how much food can we grow for ourselves? How many products? There's wonderful new ways of recycling things to produce more building materials. And we can grow bamboo and hemp and things to make a lot out of so that we're not so dependent. Because as we lose our beaches, we also lose our piers and our airport. Uh, so <laughs> that means it may be very hard to get imports, and we have to think about the fact that here we are in the middle of the biggest tectonic plate on the planet, on the top of its highest mountains, <laughs> right? We're not going anywhere, but we're going to lose the seacoast. We're going to have to move uphill. Let's not do it with big concrete, glass, and steel high rises up there in our beautiful forests. Let's build appropriate, natural, more natural architecture. Let's look at all the things we can do for each other. Is, is there some discussion in, in, in there of the, the allotment of resources or, or how you control population? I mean, do you, do you get into that and, and well, from a values yeah. point of view? How does that work? I don't think population control is going to be the issue. Uh, it's resource consumption is always the issue. Uh, in, in those terms, you know, we are far more consumptive. True than enough. It takes, uh, yeah, <laughs> yes. but six, anyway, 60 yes. people in India. Yes, we'll be do, one in I US. think we'll be doing much stronger self governance here. And so we will be talking about all those things. Why right now can't we allot land and very simple housing for the homeless, which would be far cheaper than the social services that we have to give people by keeping them in the streets? And that ungodly practice of sweeps where you destroy everything they've built and then let them forage again from start is crazy. It's very expensive for our city and there are cheaper ways of housing people and getting them into the culture with appropriate treatment and all those things. 
So I think we've, we've all seen no room in paradise, right? <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> so there's so much to do here in Hawaii and so many people already working on it uh, that if we just come together cooperatively and recognize that we ha we're in one canoe here and we're right now sailing through the perfect storm of crises that we've created for ourselves, uh, think Hokalea, think Malama, uh, Honua, or yeah. the other way around. Yes. <laughs> um, so we can do it. We've got Papahano Mokuakea going. We, you know, we're concerned. We can build new food supplies in the ocean in clean, green ways. But we have to, we have to want, want, be satisfied with the the fish and the food that we grow here, and not insist on having. Um, you know, apples from South Africa. Yeah, well, you can insist all you want, but they're going to stop coming in. So you might as well. I do think we should have great food variety here. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think we all want to live on poi. Uh, right. You know, right. Um, yeah. So, so it's like, are, are you <laughs> saying that wonderful the, as those are as staples, we can continue great variety here. What's the problem? We can grow things all year round. You know, we can have pretty much anything we want. So in the last two minutes, <laughs> I just, I would like to thank you because literally it is a, a, a daily exercise that some, somewhere in, in my day um, I start getting depressed and then I, and I think of your, um, okay, where it's just, we're just being immature. We're just being immature. <laughs> it's time to evolve. <laughs> and that gives me a little, a little moment to, to take a breath and, and have, have the energy to, to go on. But Elizabeth, what is it that, that gives you? Um, uh, w you are one of my favorite octogenarians, I must, I must say. And it's always a pleasure. What, where do you really source your, your joy and your energy? Well, I think of wonderful comedians like Swami Biyandananda, who in real life is, is an economist, talking about what we need now is the great upwising <laughs> of people. <laughs> upwising is my version of maturity. And what I like to say to people is, find something you really love doing that can somehow contribute to a better world and do that. Don't make it, oh, I have to do this, I have to sign this petition, I have to go do this. Uh, no, whatever, if you're a poet or a gardener or a, a computer repair technician or whatever you are, find ways of promoting a story of a cooperative world, knowing nature's on your side here. You know, this is just the natural next thing to get through this adolescent crisis into this upwising and to recognize that this planet is here to support us in happiness and thriving. Uh, thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> Upwise. Up, wise up. Wise up. <laughs> wise up, everybody. <laughs>